Welcome back, everyone. I just wanted to start this episode by thanking you for your patience the past few weeks. And to those of you whose messages I've neglected to respond to, I'll get to those soon, too. And without further ado, it's time to cover the war that laid the foundations of the British Empire and changed America forever. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tinsalvola, a show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. Today, I thought I'd start with an overview of exactly what English America looked like on the eve of Civil War, 1642. Since we haven't covered some of the colonies in months, and since this is the first multi-colony series, and because I suspect some people will be interested in this topic who weren't interested in previous ones, I thought it was a good idea to give a quick recap and tie up some loose ends. Plus, it'll be convenient when we reach the end of the series to be able to look back and see just how much America changes over the course of this war. And finally, it's a chance to give the briefest of introductions to non-future U.S. colonies, whose histories I'll be discussing a little bit over the course of this series, because I really think it's more effective to treat the Americas as a theater of the war. But without further expanding on the reasons for my content choices, let's get to the content itself. When Civil War broke out in 1642, England had about 51,000 people spread across colonies in North America and the Caribbean. There's no way to get a really precise figure, but that's a scholarly estimation. And arbitrarily going from north to south, our first colony is Newfoundland, snuggled among the hilly, rocky shores of modern Canada, there had been a multinational European presence on Newfoundland since the 16th century, mostly seasonal fishermen. In terms of the English presence on the island, most of the ships and their captains were from the West Country, hiring crews on a yearly basis and filling as many merchant ships as possible with cod, before returning for the winter. Sometimes crews would leave members behind at fledgling settlements over winter so that they had more room to transport fish back home. And by 1642, there were a small handful of permanent settlements, most notably Fairyland, where the colonists built, owned, and maintained boats and maintained and protected shore facilities continued to catch fish, cut wood, trap furs, and provide services and supplies to the migratory fishing crews. In summer, Newfoundland served as a base for fishing activities as far south as Cape Cod, but in winter there was only the tiniest of populations. By 1642, there were about 200 people living there full-time, plus whatever crews stayed behind every year. George Calvert, first Lord Baltimore's first colony, had been the Avalon Colony in Newfoundland, but by 1637 the king had, rightfully or wrongfully, deemed Avalon abandoned and given the proprietorship to the earls of Pembroke and Holland, and David Kirk, who was now governor of the colony, and took leadership over its future development. His goal was essentially to give order to what had previously been a thoroughly informal but reasonably effective society. As you can imagine, this was resented by the more established fishermen, but it's also worth noting that ideologically, politically, and on matters of religion, Kirk and his predecessors were closely aligned. Just south of Newfoundland, there were a series of villages and outposts in the area that we now call Maine. Similarly remote, 
Maine had a handful of English fishing and fur trading outposts along the coast with a combined 500 English settlers. And similarly to Newfoundland, it had an international presence, although Maine's fur traders had a more contentious relationships because of the amount of money involved in the fur trade. And the biggest conflict was in French Acadia between rival French traders Charles Latour and Charles Dalnay. The Lord Proprietor of Maine was Ferdinando Gorges, who remained thoroughly hostile to Massachusetts' claims in New England, and Maine was governed by his nephew Thomas. But while Ferdinando was and continued to be an ardent and steadfast royalist, his nephew was not. Thomas was a Puritan and had even spent a fair amount of time in Boston. But on the whole, the main population shared their proprietor's beliefs and sympathies. And moving south, we reach the region which, for convenience sake, I'll be referring to as New England. Technically, Maine is a part of New England, but in the 1640s, it was separated from the ideologically intertwined and largely unified colony south of it. They shared a common goal and a history that Maine simply didn't, despite their governor's sympathy for it. So from now on, when we refer to New England, I'll be talking about Massachusetts Bay, New Plymouth, Connecticut, New Haven, Rhode Island, and Fort Saybrook. Unlike the small, informal settlements to the north, if you lived in New England, you lived in a relatively well-structured town. In fact, you probably lived in a town with people who had moved over from England with you, as the vast majority of emigration to New England involved pastors taking their congregations with them. In fact, with the exception of Plymouth in Rhode Island, lone Puritans weren't even allowed to set out on their own in New England. The focus was on community, and inhabitants embraced a variant of Puritanism which advocated for community liberty with little to no emphasis on individual liberty. By far the largest of these New England colonies was the colony of Massachusetts Bay, which was actually by this point by far the largest English colony in America, with about 13,000 people. It was the original Puritan colony, envisioned and advertised as a model Puritan society, which could use its example and its prayers to further the cause of Reformation in England and Europe. And helping it achieve its goal was the fact that it was simultaneously legally recognized and essentially self-governing, through a little bit of strategic wording on its charter. The king hadn't noticed the anomaly before they'd taken their charter to New England, where they essentially used it as a foundation for their own government system. Of the New England colonies, Massachusetts was the second strictest, but only second because it actually did have to accommodate the sheer quantity of people who'd moved there. As we've seen, and as we will see, Puritanism wasn't a totally unified ideology. So when people with slightly different views came to Massachusetts, it stretched its notions of propriety ever so slightly to accommodate that. They still ended up in battles and exiling plenty of heretics while malcontents moved to and founded other New England colonies. But there were definitely people with differences in Massachusetts, united for a common cause. Though relatively affluent, Massachusetts was in the middle of an economic downturn in 1642, because a lot of its economy had been built on selling things like cattle to newcomers. When the political system started to look more hopeful for Puritans in England, Immigration had essentially stopped. Massachusetts had built 
the foundations of trade and industry, but neither of these was developed enough to actually sustain an economy. Bordering Massachusetts Bay was New England's oldest colony, Plymouth. Plymouth's story, as we all know, started in 1620 with the Pilgrims, a group of Brownists. Brownism was essentially a type of Puritanism, but one which advocated separation from the Church of England instead of activism within it. In addition to their core congregation, they had a significant group of people who they referred to as strangers who embraced a wide variety of beliefs, from more standard Puritanism to more radical Brownism to Anglicanism. But by 1642, Plymouth was a very different place than it had originally been. In the years since Pastor John Robinson's death and since the foundation of Massachusetts Bay, Plymouth had started to adhere to a more standard variation of the Puritan model. Most of the strangers had left, some to Massachusetts, a few to Newfoundland, but most to England or Virginia. Meanwhile, the pilgrims had to navigate life in what was no longer a wilderness and without the guidance of their deeply important pastor. Its early history, in which it had had to accommodate people of different beliefs, and Robinson's lingering influence had made Plymouth a place that was much more amenable to individual migration and much more tolerant of a variety of beliefs and behaviors so long as they stayed within the Calvinist framework. So the majority of Plymouth's population was now comprised of people seeking more tolerance than other New England colonies were willing to provide, but without being the radicals who came to comprise Rhode Island. Puritans, but of a mellower stripe. And there were enough of these people that Plymouth had now expanded to include four towns totaling about 2,500 people. Plymouth was still a relatively poor colony, less affluent than any other New England colony except parts of Rhode Island. Its land was infertile, its harbor was inferior, and its early debt continued to linger. Not to mention that the Pilgrims had never been particularly affluent, either in England or in Leiden. And the fur trading posts, which had been supposed to support them economically, had been taken either by the French, actually specifically by Latour, or sadly by Puritan newcomers. Their main economic asset was now the ability to sell cattle and land to newcomers because Poconocet slash Wampanoag Sachem Massasoit had agreed only to sell land to them, enabling them to buy land cheap and sell it at up to a 500% markup. And as cattle and land became the primary economic assets, even the original Brownist congregation started to disperse leading William Bradford to lament that they were choosing prosperity over their original vision. By 1642, they were even considering moving their capital to a new town at a better harbor, even though this was on land still reserved for the Indians, and even though the location was too small to accommodate Plymouth's whole congregation, which would mean even more decentralization. Plymouth was on the verge of, and would soon complete, the full transition from Brownist plantation to Puritan colony. Skipping Rhode Island for a minute, the next colony west of Plymouth was Connecticut, which had been founded by ministers, most notably Thomas Hooker, whose vision of a Puritan society clashed with that of Massachusetts Bay enough that they had moved to a place out of its control. Some of their differences were theological and some were political, but in short, the ministers and congregations who founded the Connecticut River towns, but in short, 
the ministers and congregations who founded the Connecticut River towns wanted a less severe society than that developing in Massachusetts. They were less strict in terms of religion, and they wanted a more democratic government with codified laws, the right for non-church members to vote, and less legal discretion for judges and magistrates, who they viewed as a source of arbitrary power. In fact, it was the only Puritan colony apart from Plymouth to allow non-church members to vote. Connecticut's milder citizens came largely from the West Country, one of the most steadfastly Anglican and Royalist regions of England, where Puritans of any sort were a distinct minority, and a place which supplied far more people to Virginia than it did to New England. Its governor was John Winthrop's son, John Winthrop Jr. These factors combined with good land, and harbors made Connecticut one of the more affluent colonies in the region. But it had no charter, meaning it had no official state recognition or permission to settle. It was what could most accurately be described as a squatter colony, deriving its supposed legitimacy from Indian land purchases and informal agreements with the Englishmen who held the patents for the land. It was totally self-governing and totally illegitimate in its legal standing, but it valued its independence to the point that it had refused to join multiple attempted New England confederations, which it feared would subordinate it to Massachusetts. Next is Saybrook, but Saybrook was neither a flourishing nor a contentious or eventful colony apart from its role in the Pequot War, and by 1644 it would sell itself to Connecticut in a peaceful and mutually beneficial transaction. How dull. Let's move on. And moving on brings us to New Haven, which was in a similar position to Connecticut economically and also legally in that it had no charter. And similarly to Connecticut, its relatively small number of colonists had the same area of origin within England, but for New Haven, this was London. And in contrast to Connecticut, which was particularly lenient, New Haven was extraordinarily strict. In fact, its entire religious and political system was essentially based on the principle of taking what John Cotton said and applying it as strictly as possible. This wasn't possible in Massachusetts, but with a population of only about 800 people, it was totally doable in New Haven. Its leading minister, John Davenport, was most ideologically and theologically aligned with Hugh Peter, and in fact was one of Peter's followers. And in fact, it had been Peter's who had suggested the location of Quinnipiac to Davenport and Governor Theophilus Eaton. So not only did New Haven only allow church members to vote, That policy was written into the unchangeable group of laws its government was based on. It was a foundational principle of New Haven. Adding its small population to its strict church and government policies, multiple towns didn't even have 12 people qualified for full voting citizenship. That meant they didn't have enough people to sit on a jury, and because of this, they didn't use juries at all allowing magistrates to decide the bigger cases with complete and total discretion, while deputies decided smaller cases the same way. There's only one way in which New Haven was less strict than other colonies, and that's that neither it nor Plymouth had sumptuary laws regarding extravagant clothing. And one observer noted that the reason for this was simple. Plymouth was too poor for that to be an issue, while New Haven was too rich. And they were rich. 
With a strong London mercantile tradition, they had left Massachusetts for two reasons. First was a stricter society, and second was more economic opportunity, dreaming of building up intercolonial and transatlantic commerce. And in addition to a particularly nice harbor, they had found fertile land and a strategic location for beaver trading and whaling. And that brings us to the region which, for clarity, brevity, and sanity's sake, I will be calling Rhode Island. More accurately dubbed a pariah colony than a Puritan one, this region consisted of four towns of New England outcasts, with a combined population of about 600. It wasn't exactly a colony in 1642, and like a number of the colonies we've discussed, it had no charter in 1642. Each town was a distinct self-governing community, and by choice or by rejection, they were the most independent colony in a North America which was already pretty autonomous. Even the least radical of its citizens was there because they had in some way rejected the established order and had some level of distrust of power and anti-authoritarianism. These were the people who rejected Puritan legalism every bit as much as they rejected Anglican formalism. They were Anabaptist, Antinomians, and they would soon be Baptists and Quakers. All sects which emphasized the Holy Spirit, erring on the side of too little structure rather than too much. There's actually an interesting callback to be made here, as the person who had introduced these ideas into English society had been John Smith, the pastor who had traveled to the Netherlands with John Robinson and the Pilgrims, but separated once they'd gotten there, because Robinson was more traditional, while Smith was more radical. So while Puritan New England was hard at work building a theocracy, Rhode Island was full of people who were willing to leave everything behind and even live in shocking poverty to grow in a personal relationship with God. And politically, they were also unorthodox, subordinating all executive and judicial power to the legislature and reserving the most important powers to the towns instead of any central authorities, including the power to initiate legislation. Two of its towns, Providence and Shawomet, were on the mainland, with their main figure being Roger Williams. These two towns were religiously more radical, and they were thoroughly impoverished. They had no artisans, and they lived in clumsily built wooden houses al along a rough main street. They raised pigs and goats, which formed the foundation of their diet, along with game, fish, and corn. It was just a very rough, poor existence, with only the barest essentials for survival. On Aquidneck, or Rhode Island, existed Portsmouth and Newport, which had some of the finest estates in New England, with beautiful brick houses sitting in rolling hills which grew every type of food imaginable. There were horses, cattle, sheep, barley, wheat, oats, rye, hemp, flax, apples, cheese, butter, honey, venison, fowl, fish, wild berries, and nuts. They had multiple artisans and a wealthy, educated citizenry. They also had a budding shipbuilding industry, which was already allowing them to trade with Barbados. Led primarily by William Coddington, these people were less religiously radical than the mainlanders. Mostly people banished for their support of Anne Hutchinson, Henry Vane, and John Wheelwright in the Antinomian Controversy. And they were interested in a closer relationship with the other New England colonies, 
though they were told that they would not be accepted as an independent colony and would have to be absorbed by Massachusetts or Plymouth first. So Rhode Island really was an extremely unique and also an extremely disliked part of New England. And New England out of the way, let's go down to the oldest region of English America, and also the most ideologically opposed to New England, the Chesapeake. It's kind of funny, but within the bounds of the future U.S., we're the region that would be most loyal to the king and that which would be most loyal to Parliament. The first colony to proclaim Parliament, which was the last colony to proclaim Charles II, and the last colony to proclaim Parliament, which became the only colony which installed its restoration government before Charles II even reached England. That colony, the biggest, oldest, and most royalist colony in the Chesapeake, was, of course, Virginia, with a population of about 10,000, give or take. It was also England's only crown colony, meaning the only one under direct royal control, instead of the control of a joint stock company or lord proprietor. Unlike the towns of New England, Virginia was characterized by widely dispersed tobacco farms, many of which were left vacant by the abandonment or death of their owners. It was a place where even the wealthiest people lived poorer and rougher than many of the poor in England, and where illness reduced life expectancy to the lowest in the English-speaking world. There are dozens of statistics to illustrate how hard life was there, but the one that sticks with me the most is that 75% of children lost at least one parent by the time they reached adulthood, and marriages only lasted an average of seven years before one partner died. In this rough environment, alcohol abuse was an issue, but theft really wasn't. Its population was dispersed enough that even if it had wanted to impose severe behavioral restrictions like Puritan New England, those laws would have been impossible to enforce. It was a relationship-based society instead of a community-based one. And this really extended throughout the Chesapeake, but it was first and perhaps most pronounced in Virginia. Now, Virginia was predominantly an Anglican colony, and while there was a fair amount of Puritan thought, little of it was as extreme as that found in Massachusetts. For lots of Americans who might have called themselves Puritans outside of New England, Puritanism really meant adding Puritan-style services, sermons, and spontaneous prayer to the use of the Church of England prayer book. Most of the strict Puritan thought was concentrated at the colony's northern border, where John West and John Udy had settled. And that was the only concentration of Virginians who really supported Parliament. Economically, Virginia had always struggled, but now that it was allowed to trade with the Dutch, and the Dutch paid about 20 times as much for tobacco as English merchants did, this had finally enabled Virginia to become prosperous enough that its governor, Berkeley, could successfully administer policies requiring that people build brick houses and grow a variety of crops to create a well-rounded diet. So now they had apples, peaches, livestock, breweries, and herbs like thyme, marjoram, and rosemary growing in abundance for the first time ever. Berkeley also started requiring that ships trading in the colony who sold alcohol there simultaneously bring at least 10 times the value in necessary goods. So for the first time in its 35-year history, Virginia was something better than hell on earth, a slaughterhouse, or a more efficient way of killing people. And that gets to the heart of its royalism. Virginia's greatest fear was that a new 
joint stock company would be put over it. And truly, its experience with the Virginia Company had been horrific. It was absolutely desperate to remain a crown colony. There were some people who wanted to reconstitute the Virginia Company, and Parliament was willing to entertain those ideas. But the king had maintained Virginia as a royal colony throughout the duration of his reign. Virginia's second greatest fear was losing its legislature. King Charles had been the only leader Virginia had ever had who respected both its desire to remain a crown colony and its desire for a legislature. And in fact, he'd been the only leader who had respected the colonists at all. There were criticisms of the king in Virginia. For instance, Thomas Powell remarked that kings in former times went to war, but this king is fitting for a lady's lap. But the criticisms were widely rejected, and even where they were accepted, they paled in comparison to the deep loyalty Virginia felt to the king. And when William Berkeley came, the man who himself was deeply loyal to the king, he quickly became the best governor Virginia had ever had. The king had listened to Virginia and allowed policies which allowed it to prosper, like allowing it to trade with the Dutch. So Virginia was both emotionally and pragmatically dedicated to their king. Virginia's nearest colonial relative was Bermuda, which had been founded just three years later, getting its colonial legislature just a year after Virginia had, and its history intimately connected with that of Virginia, involving many of the same people on both sides of the Atlantic. But there were a few differences, environment being one which, for instance, had pushed the tiny Bermuda to pass the first conservation legislation in the New World. Its tobacco was of worse quality than that of Virginia, but similar to Virginia, it hadn't really been successful in diversifying its economy and moving away from what was, in England, a worthless weed. But the biggest difference between Virginia and Bermuda was that Bermuda was still run by a joint stock company, with some of the same investors as those of the old Virginia company, especially the Earl of Warwick. While Bermuda's colonists were democrat were demographically and culturally similar to those in Virginia, Warwick's leadership had definitely inserted a larger Puritan element, though, again, one which was mostly less extreme than that of New England. Like Virginia, in Bermuda there was frustration, gambling, brawling, and drinking, and they had dealt with more poor leadership than good. And poor conditions had pushed a fair number of colonists to move to either St. Lucia or Virginia. The third and most different Chesapeake colony was Maryland, under Lord Proprietor Cecil Calvert, second Lord Baltimore, and his brother Leonard was governor. It was specifically founded as a haven where Catholics could live without persecution, though it was not officially a Catholic colony because it would never have been able to get away with that. So, while most of Maryland's leadership was Catholic, there were a handful of Protestant leaders, mostly friends of the Calvert family, and many of the colony's artisans and servants, who were getting their freedom in ever greater numbers, were Protestant, and in fact mostly Puritan. And it had a Puritan settlement on Kent Island, whose residents had moved there from Virginia a year before Baltimore got the patent for the land who became, for the land which became Maryland. So, with a very small Anglican group in the middle, Maryland was largely comprised of Catholics and Puritans. It was the smallest Chesapeake colony with only about 600 surviving people, and it 
suffered from many of the same problems as Virginia, such as poverty, illness, low life expectancy, and the inability to successfully diversify its economy. And south of the Chesapeake was a group of fledgling settlements in the Caribbean. English presence in this region had begun with a long string of failed colony attempts in Guiana, whose only real accomplishment was when former Jamestown resident Matthew Morton became the first Englishman to travel the length of the Amazon River over the course of 13 months in an Indian canoe. But the Spanish and Portuguese were pretty adamant that the English not settle in South America, and by diplomacy, attack, or siege, they ensured that it didn't happen. But Guiana had united a lot of the people who would become active in Caribbean colonization, including the earls of Pembroke, Carlisle, Holland, and, of course, Warwick. And it was one of the Guiana settlers Thomas Warner, who ended up founding the first successful English colony on St. Christopher's, which the English called St. Kitts. And it was from Warner's colony on St. Kitts that the other successful English Caribbean colonies had sprung. Despite abnormally frequent hurricanes and a major Spanish attack, St. Kitts had grown big enough and fast enough that its population quickly spread. Nevis, Montserrat, Martinique, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Grenada, Antigua, and assorted smaller islands, most of the Lesser Antilles, were under Lord Proprietor James Hay, the Earl of Carlisle, with Warner as governor and John Jefferson as his deputy. And all of these were populated by people moving away from St. Kitts. And yes, according to what I read, John Jefferson is probably the ancestor of Thomas. But there was a conflict in the Caribbean centered around the island of Barbados, because when a captain named Henry Powell had stopped by St. Kitts, and some of his sailors had mentioned Powell's intention to colonize Barbados, Warner rushed back to England to ensure that Carlyle's patent included Barbados, and only after that did Powell arrive in England and realize what had happened. He quickly found a backer named William Cortine to organize investment from England and rushed back to Barbados to get his colony started before Warner could start his. Cortine got the Earl of Pembroke to be his and Powell's patron and sponsor, and Pembroke's patent also included Trinidad and Fonseca alias St. Bernard, which didn't even exist. A while later, Pembroke sold his patent to the Earl of Warwick, so now the Caribbean was divided, and Barbados was in two different patents to two different people under two different spellings, with two different groups of colonists actually settled on the island, claiming that theirs was the legitimate claim. Conflict about this had, a few years before, led to a show trial and execution two people being kidnapped and chained to a ship's mast for a month, and the theft of multiple thousands of pounds worth of tobacco. And at one point, the conflict became so all-consuming and violent that planting was neglected, food ran short, and the colony went through a year-long starving time. While their masters had bickered and fought, the servants had stopped working and indulged in the classic colonial escapism, drinking. In England, the king had settled the conflict in Carlisle's favor, but to no effect on Barbados. For a while, Henry Howley, brother of Maryland official Jerome, had been governor of the island, appointed by Carlisle, but then shifting his allegiance to Warwick when Carlisle withdrew his commission, 
and Warwick let him continue as governor, so now he was vying to keep his position against Carlisle's new appointee, Henry Hunks, which he did by purging troublesome officials, but then Hunks had shown his authority and sent Howley back to England, where he was charged with and then exonerated from 13 barely believable charges in 1641. The conflict was only ended when Hunks was replaced by Philip Bell, the old Bermuda and Providence Island governor, and a man that both Carlisle and Warwick could agree on for the job. So in 1641, Bell had moved there as governor. So, by 1642, St. Kitts and Barbados were the two main colonies, with settlements of varying sizes on multiple other islands which closely resembled those on St. Kitts. Colonists in all the colonies grew tobacco as their primary commodity because it was the perfect crop for a new colony, apart from the fact that it was worthless. It wasn't particularly labor-intensive, and there were plenty of people available who could teach settlers how to grow it. They also planted cotton for a similar reason. And more than anywhere else in the Americas, colonists across nationalities had close relationships and connections, closer in many cases than they did with their own home governments. They shared islands freely and were united in enmity of the Spanish and fear of the Carib Indians. Their buccaneers fought together, and they dealt with the same hurricanes and experimented with the same commodities. But because the Dutch economy was so much more developed, the Dutch definitely ended up driving the most economic development in the Caribbean. It wasn't yet a prosperous life, but it wasn't an altogether unpleasant one, and we have some vivid images of what life is like there from a man named Henry Colt, who unfortunately was executed by the Spanish in 1632. He had tried to set up a colony, with his son organizing things from England, and he had sent back tobacco, pines, plantains, guavas, prickly pears, and pepper. He talked about the value placed on fresh water, about eating his dinner off of a chest on the beach, and he also told his son that he'd considered sending his grandson a parrot, quote, but they be cursed and biting. So that's a summary of English America on the verge of war. No colony yet had many Africans, and every colony had a few. Only on Rhode Island were they specifically not slaves, and only in Massachusetts and Connecticut was slavery codified, something which had been done after the Pequot War. No colony was doing extremely well economically, but most had reason for optimism, and most colonies were operating with a large degree of independence from England. There wasn't much English oversight, and colonists had essentially the same legal status as Englishmen in the home country. They were all subjects of the crown, though perhaps those choosing to live under proprietary lords or work for joint stock companies. There was no empire, There was a kingdom and assorted dominions, a hodgepodge of different colonial projects pursued by individual subjects of the king. But in 1642, all of this would start to change because after years of growing conflict, King Charles I and his parliament finally went to war. And next week, we'll look at exactly how that happened and how colonists reacted.